Thank you so much to Richard Webb for agreeing to do this for our library. So a little bit about Richard Webb Jr. He is an author, an award-winning educator, and a documentary filmmaker. A graduate of Vanderbilt University, he taught history for 24 years at both the high school and college levels. A featured presenter in the Connecticut Public Broadcasting Prohibition documentary, Connecticut Goes Dry. Webb is also co-creator and co-producer with Robert Williams of a documentary film about the Fitzgeralds in Connecticut, which is a companion to his book, which is Boats Against the Current. I'm reading the abbreviated title. He has been a resident of the Westport, Connecticut area since 1967 and is a national consultant to many historical societies and libraries. He lives happily in a historic home with his wife, Deborah, and their two dogs who are present tonight, Zelda and Daisy. So welcome, Richard Webb. Thank you, Chivana. And, uh, yeah, this is, uh, it's not staged. Uh, 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 Daisy often joins me because as I was talking to Giovanna about, uh, she's a Velcro dog, so she never leaves my side. So welcome, everybody. I hope you're not um, zoomed out too much, and I hope everybody you know is uh, healthy and happy and safe. And what I'm going to be doing, if you want to turn on your cameras, uh, be happy to see you. Um, you can ask questions via the chat function. I'll, I'll take them at the end of the, um, hi, Tony. Um, I'll, <laughs> I'll take it, uh, I'll take them at the end. And if you want to unmute yourself, um, at the end and ask questions, uh, I, you know, very, very much encourage you. Okay. Well, what I'm going to do, let me just show you kind of what you're going to see. You're going to see me very briefly. That's good news for you. Uh, I'll be at the beginning and at the end of the presentation. In between, you're going to see a, a series of images. I'm going to be making three, four transitions. So just hang with me while I do that, and I'll let you know when I'm doing that. And what I'm going to end with is uh, a short clip from our award-winning documentary. We're very happy with, with the documentary because this year, the New Yorker uh, listed their top 36 films of 2020, and we were honored to be in at number 30, so we'll take it. This isn't a story about obsession, okay? This is obviously a story about Scott and Zelda, but it's also about going against common thought and fighting back uh, where people told me I was crazy. So um, one of the things I wanna kind of introduce was when they came here in the summer of 1920, they were facing three identical challenges that we're facing today. I mean, there's that, that great saying, uh, if history doesn't repeat, repeat itself, maybe, maybe it rhymes. But in this case, it, this is history repeating itself because they faced these three challenges. One, a worldwide pandemic, and not to make light of COVID, but much deadlier, 50 million people dead of influenza. Two, the worst race riots in American history since Reconstruction, 32 American cities, mass lynchings. Um, and that included the biggest rise of white supremacy the country had seen. For example, this is when the KKK gets its maximum membership. Interesting, right? And the other one was a total collapse of the economy. Um, and um, luckily, we, we have somehow gotten through it a little bit easier than um, they did then. Matter of fact, it was so bad, they called it the Great Depression because the Great The hadn't happened yet. And actually, there was a fourth thing I was thinking about the other day. And that is that um, there was a great debate beginning between science and reason uh, and faith. I'm sorry. And that was the Scopes Monkey Trial teaching evolution or creationism. So what goes around comes around. Okay, I'm gonna make my first transition. So you should be seeing a PowerPoint. And I wanna thank Giovanna because with all of this technology now, librarians have very, very long hours. 
Um, you know, they, they'll work all day and then they've got to come home and, you know, uh, do this. So I really appreciate it. Okay, here is the cover of the book. I called it Boats Against the Current for two reasons. One, it's the last line of The Great Gatsby. Uh, it's in the last sentence, rather. And the other one was that to prove what I tried to prove, and I've been per pursuing this story for 42 years. Actually, we're coming on 43. Uh, the film and writing the book took seven years. And the entire time we were doing this, we were, we were told we were crazy. As a matter of fact, a good friend of mine, uh, who, Walter Robichek, who's a major Fitzgerald academic, said, uh, Deej, that's my nickname, he said, Deej, um, trying to get Westport in the top 25 places, even the top 25 places that influenced the Fitzgeralds is a noble uh, but totally lost cause. But lo and behold, as an educator that I used to be, I would always tell my students, look for yourselves. Don't accept all conventional wisdom. You know, read on your own and look for evidence. And so when I actually looked at the evidence, I found out, and this had been missed by everybody, that it was the place that influenced their works the most and by hands down. Now, you know, that's kind of a parochial sort of argument, right? Like you might be saying to yourself, well, who cares about Westport, right? But that's kind of not the big story here. The big story was I was told I was crazy. The big story was that uh, even the expert um, Fitzgerald uh, scholar um, was against this thesis. And all I had to do was read everything they wrote and read everything written about them. And I'm not making that sound like a task because it certainly wasn't, it was anything but. Um, so here I am looking into the work and biography of one of the most poured over figures in literary history. And I found gobs of stuff. So for example, The Beautiful and Damned uh, Top is his second novel. He wrote most of it in Westport. And by the way, it's his least read. And what I'm going to do is the beginning of this presentation, I'm going to be focusing on this book. Let me tell you why. I know you want to get to Gatsby, and, and I'm going to move fast to the, the B and D, as we call it, and get to Gatsby. But here's the thing. As my friend Charles Scribner III, Charles Scribner III is the grandson of the great House of Scribner that published Hemingway, Wolf, and Fitzgerald. He said, Deej, the beautiful and damned is the dry run for the great Gatsby. So one of the things you can win cocktail party points if we ever go back to those uh, is that you can read his second novel, the least read of his novels, and it's a dry run for The Great Gatsby. And as Scott famously said, all my characters are F. Scott Fitzgerald, and a lot of his female ones were Zelda. So The Beautiful and Damned, among other things, has a newly married couple honeymooning in Connecticut. And in Zelda's only novels, Save Me the Waltz, she's got a young married couple living in Connecticut. And what's amazing is there are, are scenes that are almost identical, but one's from a male perspective and one's from a female perspective. In her only play, Scandalabra, she took the premise of The Beautiful and Damned and reversed it. It's in five of Scott's short stories and one of his biggest short stories, Cruise of the Rolling Junk. And of course, while you're probably here for, is for Gatsby. Okay, here they are. Um, these are America's first pop stars, literally. They were followed in the press. This was the birth of mass media in America. Um, Dorothy Parker said they were so striking, it looked like they came out of the sun. And they have the signal honor, and I have not heard of this before or since. They get thrown out of the city of New York. <laughs> Can you imagine? I mean, you know, the city that never sleeps, right? I mean, how, well, they got thrown out. Let me tell you why. They get married. They're there for five weeks. They stay in the Biltmore and the Commodore hotels. Zelda's, you know, swimming nude in fountains in Union Square. But what was the last straw was when they abused a brand new invention that uh, 
the hotel was using. And that was called the revolving door. And what did Scott and Zelda do with this revolving door? They um, spun in it for 30 minutes so nobody could get in, get in or out. Now, let me, as you look at this picture, this is um, uh, the day of their wedding. Um, keep in mind that she's 19 the entire time I'm going to be telling you this story. That's it. And he's 24. And he's just published this tremendous book called This Side of Paradise. So after five weeks after their marriage, they get in a uh, Mormon, a secondhand Mormon, and they're on their way to Lake Champlain. But Scott finds out that on the way that Lake Champlain is too cold to swim in. And as he famously said, he said, if Zelda can't swim, she's miserable. So uh, wanting to live on the coast, they basically took a right and ended up in Westport, Connecticut. Uh, cover of the book, one of uh, the great quotes Scott said about this, he said, the artist got um, the girl pretty well. And he goes, but, but that's a rather debauched version of me. So <laughs> that's based on Scott. That's the art that's based on Scott. He wrote uh, most of this book in Westport, which is called The Fictional Town of Marietta. Um, and it's straight autobiography, as you're going to see, um, especially in the beginning. All right. They go and they rent this house. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to move fast through this part of the presentation, because, again, I know you want to get to Gatsby. So I'm gonna do bad teaching. I'm gonna talk while you have to read something. I'll give you more time to read uh, later, but I'm gonna have to talk while you try to read. So here's the description of the house. It still stands. There it is. It's completely intact. Um, and I lead very popular tours in Westport. By the way, if you're interested, because you know, you're know you not too far away from Westport, you can come and join us. Um, we're doing... We, we've set up five, and we end up doing 10 because of demand. So through the Westport Historical Society, I'll give you more information on that. But here Scott's describing the house as, uh, you know, a, a, a pre-revolutionary house. It was owned by the Gray family. It was painted gray then. It's talked about as being the gray house in the book, and it's still painted gray today. Um, what's lovely about it is on the left is the side porch that he describes here, and it's got one of the most famous photos of the Fitzgeralds on it, uh, not in the presentation because we just don't have time. The porch on the right was added on, and there's been add-ons in the back, but this is a perfectly preserved house, uh, and one of the best that the Fitzgeralds, matter of fact, Walter Robichek, the, the academic Fitzgerald uh, friend of mine, that it's the best preserved house that the Fitzgeralds ever lived in. All right, don't worry about this. I know this is overwhelming. This looks like a big giant broccoli salad to you. And I'm gonna not spend a lot of time in this slide. I'm gonna just let you know why I'm using it. Um, and this is an overview. This is a Google map overview of a scene in the beautiful and damned. And I'll explain the scene. Um, there's a party going on with this young married couple. And by the way, Scott and Zelda would have parties in Westport that would start Thursday night. You were expected to leave Sunday night and people would stay till Wednesday morning and then the whole fun, vicious cycle <laughs> would, would happen over again. Um, so at one of these parties, uh, they're drinking heavily. Again, she's 19, he's 24. And one of Scott's hulking, sort of creepy friends from Princeton um, hits on Zelda. And she's been drinking too much, and she's actually scared she's going to get assaulted. So she runs out of the house and goes to the train station. And she's followed by Scott a little while afterwards, once he finds out that she's escaped. And he follows her through to get on the train to go to New York City. So... This is exactly what he does with Anthony and Gloria Patch. So take a look at the bottom right here. This is the Fitzgerald estate. I mean, a Fitzgerald house, by the way, it's on the, it was on the corner, is on the corner of uh, a mystery millionaire's 175 acre estate. We'll hear more about that later. So what happens is Gloria, who's Zelda, Anthony, who's Scott, run from the house up here, run to this road here, run up to the train bridge and across. Now, what I'm about to show you is just select parts 
of um, what had happened. And it's full of much more biography. And what I did was at the age of 14, I read The Beautiful and Damned, and I was absolutely stunned to find out that I was reading a step-by-step, yard-by-yard description of the town of Westport. And I thought I'd made this you know, great big discovery until somebody had the audacity to uh, invent the internet. And then I found out that, no, you know, that was actually uh, known. But that's what piqued my interest in the Fitzgerald house um, at the age of 14. At the age of 16, I read Gatsby, and I'll talk about that. So anyway, Scott talks about this entire escapade. So she rounds the house, goes to the front path of the road, And literally about a half a mile, she comes up to this barn. And by the way, that was the only building between where they lived on the corner of a mystery millionaire's estate and the town of Westport. Now, by the way, it's a totally beautifully redone barn. And my wife and I almost bought it, um, uh, but we didn't. And we're very happy. We lived down at Campo Beach where uh, I grew up. So I grew up a quarter of a mile away from the Fitzgerald house and I live about a mile away from it uh, now. Um, she turns the road and she enters the wood. Again, step-by-step -step descriptions. And again, I'm only showing you fragments. There's much more description. It had been a rainy, stormy night. The moon comes out. You get this gleam of silver on the road before her. Now I'm gonna give you a second to read this, it's key. Okay, <clears throat> so I love the description. Those towers are still there. That's great Scott Fitzgerald, classic Scott Fitzgerald, talking about, it looks like a, the legs of a giant spider. I love that. But look at what he test drives for the first time five years before Gatsby, the little green light. The single most important color, I'll argue, in uh, American fiction, it's also the entire single most important motif of the great Gatsby, symbolic of what Jay Gatz looks at, and it's symbolic of the American dream. So this is one of the many reasons that if you read The Beautiful and Damned, you see that Scott is trying to, um, trying out themes and ideas and scenes that he'll, he'll recycle, which he did a lot. You know, writing's a hard thing. I mean, to come up with new books all the time, that, that's a challenge. So what did he do? He, he would pick and choose things from his short stories and essays and previous books, and he would recombine them into new ones. Uh, again, just describing, she's running across the track. And what I love is that pedestrian walkway you see, and this is also part of the tour, all of this I'm showing you as part of the tour. He describes the um, walkway there as being a yard wide. And yes, you're listening to uh, uh, someone who's crazy. And I actually got a tape measure and measured it. It's still three feet wide <laughs> today. So it hasn't changed. Um, once you get halfway down the bridge, you take a look to the right. Uh, 95 wasn't there. And you can just see the outline of Westport in the background. And again, that was called the fictional town of Marietta. It was deforested then. I mean, we're talking about an agrarian, this is 1920, an agrarian community. So you would have seen the whole town from there. Um, and now obviously it's filled in a bit, but you can see it in the background. Um, she ends up at the train station, Zelda slash Gloria. Scott's right behind her, slash Anthony. And that building still is intact. And what I love to tell is the story that what they often would do is they would pull an all-nighter, they would get to the train station, and then they would sit on the roof and wait for the first train to, to New York City in 1920, which was the 533. And as many of you locals will know about Metro North, it took 70, 70 minutes in 1920 to go to New York City from Westport. You're lucky if it takes you that long today. 
okay? <laughs> but I know you've been stuck on many a train like, like I have. So again, he's writing from his life. Um, there's a great saying I, I used to use with my students, until you plagiarize it, it's not your own. I, I used to tell my students, go ahead and plagiarize, you know, cite your sources. But I would tell them, you know, I wasn't at the American Revolution and I'm gonna teach you things that I've learned and I'm gonna make it my own. I'm gonna plagiarize it and make it my own. So Scott was all about plagiarizing his own works. Now I'm gonna make one of three transitions here and we're gonna start to get to what you're here for and that's the great Gatsby, okay. Again, here's the cover of the book, and, and the, as you see, this is the house in the background. Now, what's really interesting about this photo, and if you look online, you'll see this is this might be the most reproduced photo of both of them, that they're here in the summer of 1920 for five months. By the way, they never owned property. They always rented. Five months was their average stay. Um, they actually spent a year and a half in Great Neck, and Gatsby is, among other things, it is about Great Neck. This isn't a zero-sum game. I just wanted to get Westport as part of the equation, and it's what I call a, a beachy blend, Gatsby is, of Westport and Great Neck. But here is 1924, and they come back. This is for the photo essay that was in Motoring Magazine called The Cruise of the Rolling Junk. I showed you the, the, the book cover. Um, before. And what's interesting is that they're here a year before Gatsby's published. So they're not only here for their honeymoon, they come back a year before Gatsby and reorient themselves to the geography of Westport, which he'll then use in Gatsby. Um, again, just a quick shot of how young and absolutely handsome and beautiful that they were. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so I was telling you that at the age of 14, I read The Beautiful and Damned. And at the age of 16, I read Gatsby. And I said, you know, gee, there's something about Westport in here. But I couldn't use you know, a couple of things I thought about, but I couldn't put it together until I read this article by Barbara Probe Solomon. She was in our film. She just passed away. She passed away a lot happier. Um, because we had improved her in entire theory. Um, and by the way, what I'm talking about today, as I told you, it was a boat against the current trying to prove this. It, uh, it's now a proven theory, so I'm not wasting your time. I can promise you that. But in this 1996 New Yorker article called Westport Wildlife, she put it all together. And in a stunning argument, laid out Westport as you know, uh, a big influence on the great Gatsby, but she, she got the wrong guy mad. Her theory went against the single most important Fitzgerald academic biographer ever by the name of Matthew Bruckley. Matthew Bruckley believed it was all about great neck. This threatened the theory of the expert and he put a lot of pressure on the New Yorker not to really publicize this article, not to reprint it. And so that's an important lesson, isn't it? Taking on the God of Fitzgerald, as it were, uh, and his reaction towards it, to kill it, was a life lesson for me. By the way, I highly recommend everything Matthew Brookley wrote, absolutely everything but it was her groundbreaking work that I took up. And what I did as a teacher, I put together some PowerPoints. I went around to schools and libraries and universities um, and senior men's clubs and women's clubs. And I showed them Westport's influence on The Beautiful and Damned and The Great Gatsby. And that turned into the book and then it turned into the film. Okay. now. This is a pretty dramatic aerial shot from the summer of 1920. They lived directly, and I mean directly, on the corner of this estate that was owned by a mystery millionaire. And I'll tell you how much of a mystery he was. When I first started researching him, there was a single sentence in, from 1907 about him on the entire internet. Well, obviously there's a lot more now. 
but here it is. Um, it was named Longshore because it had a mile of shore, hence a long shore. And it was owned by Frederick E. Lewis, and I'll get to him in just a second. But I'm gonna be pointing out um, certain elements of this photo that I'm gonna follow up on. So if you can try to follow me here, um, that would be grand. So Scott and Zelda lived um, on the corner of this estate and they would often walk, take a look to the bottom right, They'd often walk to this path, to this pool, he had three, uh, and attend parties on this green. I'm gonna show you that in just a second. There's a band shell there, and I'll show you a party there in just a little bit. Here's the house, by the way, it's totally intact uh, today. He had three beaches, and over here is a tower, top left, and an interesting dramatic complex that I'll talk about. So once again, bottom right, they would walk up, they would party here around the pool in the band shell. They would go to the beach up here, plus two others, and they would go visit this tower and this structure. Okay, now one of the reasons we're getting an aerial photo in 1920 is that the US Navy stopped one of their blimps that was going on a New York Newport run and they took a photo of his estate because they owed him a favor. And I'll be showing you the major favor that they owed him. Okay, here he is. Um, to the left, there he is as a young man at uh, Longshore. Um, and sorry, I got to uh, In the center, there he is as the kind of at the height of his powers, I like to say. Um, and on the right, he's at one of his 14 boats at Longshore, uh, and he's wearing a cowboy hat. And you might ask yourself, well, why is somebody wearing a cowboy hat uh, if he owns, uh, if he's on the East Coast and he's a sailor? But I'll show you why pretty spectacularly in a second. And where did he get his money? Well, at the age of 21, he inherited in our dollars today, um, a quarter of a billion dollars. He got it from his direct ancestor, a guy by the name of Moses Taylor. If you haven't heard of Moses Taylor, fear not, neither did I, but when I did the research on him, he was one of the first and most gigantic bankers in American history. And um, he's number 21 on the list of the richest Americans in American history, at least uh, two years ago when um, I researched that stat. Here's Longshore. And it's certainly a mansion by their standards. It's, uh, you know, these days mansions have gotten bigger, but it's a mansion. And you may say to yourself, well, this doesn't really fit my image of the mansion in Gatsby, not in the films that I see. You know, there are these sort of French chateau, Norman turreted, ginormous things. And indeed, at one point in Gatsby, he essentially describes it as that. But there's a key thing at the end that Fitzgerald does where he adopts this house as the template. When he says that right at the end, when Nick says, I went to that glorious ramshackle of a house and you know went down to the sea. And by the way, this is pretty ramshackle architectural styles. There's many um, loaded up on one another and competing with one another. And on the other side was the, was the shore. Here it is today. Um, and by the way, it, the house is still intact, the entire thing. They've got what I call a nose job on the front. That's the Longshore Inn. They've got a restaurant in the back, but it's intact. It's now a golf course. It's the ninth best golf course in Connecticut, according to the polls. And it's actually the number one wedding destination because people like to go and um, have weddings on the back lawn. But what I'm gonna do is point out to you at the top center something. And that is this, these, this sea of masts, okay? And that is now one of the three yacht clubs in town. This is the Saugatuck River Yacht Club. Well, at the time that the Fitzgeralds were there, this was the estate of Barbara Probst Salomon's family called Great Marsh, and I'll show you how big it was. This 
Their private marina is now an entire marina for, for the town. And the estate extended all the way from the left all the way to the right, encompassing where there are now seven houses today. And, you know, they, the lawns were, it was a mansion, the lawns were sculpted by Frederick Law Olmsted um, at a gas pump on the property. Tremendous house. But what was interesting was coming out from the house by the marina was the longest dock in Westport. And at the end of that dock, they had a green light. Not only did they have that, but they had a light house on their property. Now, let me show you where Scott and Zelda were swimming and where the Solomons were. Scott and Zelda were here on this beach. And right across there was the dock. I mean, it's a hips, skip and a jump, hip skip, hop, skip and a jump. And so what Barbara did when she was younger, she, she would walk to the end of her long dock and she would stare across at the estate of this mystery millionaire, F.B. Lewis. And she said, my God, this is what Scott and Zelda must have done when they were swimming there. Skinny dipping there, but I'll get to that later. In 1917, this is the entrance to Longshore. It still looks pretty much identical to this, uh, this, to this day. Uh, so this is the entrance to Effie Lewis's um, estate. And in 1917, he put these big giant posts in. Well, big giant posts are also known as posterns. And Scott uses this and puts it straight in the Great Gatsby. What he used to do in Zelda was they would take a shortcut across the property. They actually wouldn't walk down the road and enter by the main property. They took this much shorter cut. But sometimes they did walk down the road and go down um, the entrance, the formal entrance. And Scott uses this. Nick Carraway says, instead of taking the shortcut by the sound, we walk down the road a bit and we entered by the great posterns. And so there you see them. Um, and this is a very popular stop on the, the tour that I lead because, you know, people are just, they're, they're so excited to see, you know, uh, a scene in The Great Gatsby in the flesh in 2021. All right, I showed you that reflecting pool and that band shell. Here is a Lewis party in the summer of 1920. And if this isn't a Gatsby party, I don't know what is. Uh, I love the men. Uh, dressed in their summer white duck pants. Um, there's the reflecting pool. And by the way, for this one party, he brought in lily pads for it, and then he took them out. Uh, you see partygoers sitting and having cocktails. Up on the band shell, people are actually uh, dancing. But another thing he borrows and puts straight into Gatsby is that uh, Jay Gatsby has a jazz band at the party. And it, it, Fitzgerald writes, it was no mean affair, meaning average, you know, where you'd have like a trombone, a clarinet, and a drum set, and a crooner. Uh, he said it was like a full, full piece jazz band. And here you see it right here, all right, in front of the band shell and the director all dressed in white. This is a Gatsby party scene. They were frequent party goers to these uh, events. Um, and again, he uses it. All right, I'll be talking about um, his horses. Lewis was a noted equestrian and just wanted to show you a, a quick shot. Uh, Longshore's in the background, but he had uh, manicured lawns, specimen trees, and paths laid out for riders. He had a bunch of horses and fireproof stables that he kept uh, Longshore. And by the way, these are all the roads that still exist today. And so people, when they take the tour with me, are very excited about that because, you know, they, they, they're walking in. It's called walking in Gatsby shoes. All right. Well, um, take a look on the right for a second. And there's F.E. Lewis. And he's got a cowboy hat on. And that's why he had a cowboy hat on when he was at the helm of one of its boasts in Longshore and Westport. But here he is in California. And to the left is his giant 8,000 acre estate. So F.E. Lewis's house in Westport was his summer house. He spent the rest of the time in Spadra, California. 
And at the top left, you'll see he's got this giant housing. He raised world champion Duroc hogs and world champion horses. I'll get to that in a second. But uh, his feeding systems of these animals was so revolutionary, it's still used today by farmers. And he used to brand his livestock with a brand that was a diamond over a bar. And his 8,000 acre estate, he then named Diamond Bar Ranch. And by the way, that is now the entire city of Diamond Bar, California. Famous alumni are Alexis Morgan and uh, the great rapper Snoop Dogg. <laughs> My students always love that part. Um, and it was such a big estate that he had to build a private railroad on it. And if you rode a horse on it, it's 8,000 acres. He built a halfway house of some luxury. So you would ride all day and see half of his ranch, spend the night, and then go ride for the rest of the day the next day. But what he's on is a Arabian horse. Now, um, you know, you're proud, but I'm not. My wife's a rider. Um, so I learned a lot about the Arabian horse. It was, it, it was not a popular breed at the turn of the century, but along with one other guy, Lewis imported them and made them a very popular breed. Indeed, the horse that Lewis is on right here, Buffalo Bill Cody rode Moose on, uh, his champion stud, in all of his Wild West shows. So if that's not a ringing endorsement, I don't know what is. So we've got a, you know, what would be today a man with much money who also owns an entire other estate on the west coast of the United States. And he's a champion rider, hog breeder, and horse importer. We're going to go back to Longshore right now. This is the tower and the structure that I gave you a, an overview uh, before on, but we're just going to focus on the tower. Okay, we're going to get. The structure is in our next slide. So if you could just focus on the tower. Well, Scott and Zelda used to swim at this tower. There's a beach in front of it, as you can see. And at high tide, you could dive from the tower into the water. And in front of that tower, Lewis had these big two giant swimming platforms. Fitzgerald puts this straight into Gatsby when he famously writes that Gatsby's guests were diving from the tower of his raft. So again, all my characters are F. Scott Fitzgerald. Well, here's that complex I was talking about earlier. And what this is, it's a massive boathouse complex. For example, uh, he would take his boats into winter storage here. He had 14 of them. Uh, boats into winter storage here. These spars would raise them in. Uh, there. So not only do we have this millionaire with two properties, including a giant branch, and he's a champion equestrian and a champion hog breeder, here's his main yacht. And there you see in the background, the boathouse complex. This was the Kima, custom built in Stamford, Connecticut, crew of 55, 55, burned four tons of coal at sea a day and cost a million and a half dollars just to maintain at the dock. What you'll notice is that these are US Navy sailors because as we're gonna see later spectacularly, Lewis was a very patriotic guy. So he donates, I mean, he owned this for like four months and he donates it outright to the US Navy. And for the rest of the war, it was on anti-U-boat patrol um, uh, at Battery Park in New York City. So going back to why the U.S. Navy blimp stopped there, it's because they owed him favors. By the way, they stopped there all the time, and the guests really loved it that were there. Well, here is some of his other craft. I obviously couldn't show you uh, all of them, and now you understand why he's got a cowboy hat as he pilots one of his boats. But what I also like to predicate is that he's the template for Dan Cody, now, if you've read the book or might remember it, Dan Cody is the, the great millionaire yachtsman that Jay Gatz first gets his inkling of what wealth is. Jay Gatz is a crewman on his big yacht. Now, keep in mind, 
This is Scott's first residency on the East Coast. He'd gone to Princeton, but this was the first place he lived besides his boyhood home. So this is his first exposure to uh, a multimillionaire. It's his first exposure to giant yachts. I didn't picture them here, but Lewis had two of the fastest boats in existence in America in, in 1920, uh, hydroplanes. They're speed, they're speed boats. They had uh, three 500 horsepower engines and they were powered by aircraft engines. Uh, uh, the US Navy couldn't even keep up with these. And in Gatsby, to let readers know how wealthy he was, uh, Gatsby famously says to Nick, hey, Nick, um, why don't you come down to the, and we'll jump in my hydroplane and we'll go around the sound. So that was one of the motifs that Fitzgerald used to show that Gatsby was wealthy, that he could own one of these major power boats. But what's great about the story I'm going to tell you today was the powerboat and the term hydroplane had a double meaning. Fitzgerald was meaning more than just a powerboat, okay? Um, this is a later boat of F.E. Lewis. As you can see from the stern, it's out of Los Angeles, and now you know why, because he was out on the West Coast. He had seven of these, uh, not at the same time, but in succession that were named, all of them were named The Stranger. Now, this is in 1938. What he's about to do is go on a deep South Seas voyage, uh, ostensibly for marine biology. For example, earlier, he brought back the first seals to the San Francisco Zoo. But part of his mission was to spy secretly for the US government on Japanese air and naval installations in Southeast Asia. Uh, and indeed, three years later, the Japanese would attack Pearl Harbor. So again, a very patriotic guy and donated a ship in World War II. All right. Now, here is another hydroplane. Hydro, water, plane, literally plane, water plane, seaplane. These were insanely rare at the time. Remember, this is 1920. The plane's just been invented for, you know, all intents and purposes. It was very rare to own your own, and it was incredibly rare to actually own a seaplane. By the way, they're so dangerous to operate, most insurance companies still won't use them, won't insure them to, to this day. And so when Fitzgerald said to the reading audience of 1925 that Gatsby had a hydroplane, at least part of the audience is thinking it's a powerboat. Another part of the audience is thinking it's a seaplane. But what Fitzgerald meant was for the audience to think of that he had both in the same time. And the way that, and the reason that Fitzgerald does things like this is using one word to mean multiple things, is that Gatsby is less than 50,000 words. I mean, almost every sentence is pregnant with meaning. And it's a great example of what Mark Twain said. Mark Twain said at one point, sorry for writing you a long letter. I didn't have time to write you a short one. <laughs> Meaning to really write a great concise book, eh, you got to work on it and work on it and work on it. So again, the hydroplane, uh, a symbol that Fitzgerald uses from his time in Westport. Here he is. Uh, there he is with his first wife. By the way, he had four over his lifetime, including his last one was the 18-year-old daughter of his former college roommate. So I wonder how that, how that went down. Um, but here he is with his chauffeur and his wife uh, in this big, lovely um, limousine. Well, he had several other cars on the property. Two of them are worth, to, uh, in today's dollars, would have been worth $160,000. And he had one that in today's dollars was worth a quarter of a million dollars. And what I found out, I mean, I had gone so deep in the rabbit hole with this guy. What I found out by researching him 
was that he was actually a race car driver too. He is in all these motoring journals in all of these races in the country from about 1907 to 1915. And I would like to tell you that he came in first place. He never did, but he came in, you know, third, fourth, and fifth. And what I love is in one of the races, I believe it was in 1907, he lost to a car that had a top speed of 40, 40 <laughs> miles an hour. Such were race cars in 1907. So, expensive car owner, champion horse and hog breeder, champion equestrian, yachtsman, gazillionaire, it's Gatsby. As a matter of fact, <laughs> he out Gatsby's Gatsby. <laughs> Exponentially, you know, so it was really interesting to find that again. I'll go back to that, that story I was telling you earlier that when I first started researching, there was a single sentence about this guy. Uh, talk about a mystery millionaire, he was till his dying day. Okay, I'm going to give you a second to read some of this. This is the local newspaper coverage of the biggest party ever thrown in Connecticut history by F.E. Lewis, and this is the local coverage. And then I'm gonna start talking to you guys about individual stories that are here. Okay, I told you he's a patriotic guy. What does he do? He was a big, giant, all-day event as a World War I fundraiser to sell war bonds. Just to give you an idea of this party, and by the way, when I tell you some of the main points of this party and who was there and what was going on, it's just some of what was going on at this all-day party. For example, I discovered that 800 cars parked on the property. Let me just tell you right now, 1917, the car again, that is also a brand new uh, invention for the most part. And to have 800 cars parked there, I don't know how many were in the entire state of Connecticut. And I analyzed and looked up all the society people and bankers and industrialists that were at this party. And they alone were worth in today's money in the tens of billions of dollars. And he, he did a good job raising money for this. Okay, so ethos, this party. Now, what you'll notice at the top left, so Houdini's there, all right? And so what Lewis gets is the biggest entertainment in America at that time. Houdini's there, you probably know Houdini, he used to do this, you know, they would lower him into the river in a box that was chained and he would escape. Uh, but Lewis goes one step further. He uses one of his cranes that he uses to move his boats in and out of the water. And he hooks up Houdini at the end of it in a box and he swings it way out into Long Island Sound and drops it. And of course, everybody freaks out. Oh my God, Houdini's dead, but then he pops up. All right, so just one example of the star power that he brought. But to take a look at the left, you'll notice something right after that. Arrow club to carry passengers skyward. All right, again, 1917. Let's just imagine you came over like about 8 billion other Americans have claimed in their life that you're one of the original people from the Mayflower. Okay, so I'm talking 1620. So let's just pretend that, okay? You, you, your family came over in the Mayflower and that's 1620. Well, 300 years of your family history and you'd be the first to fly. Now that's big. How many generations is that? 300 years in the history of your family and you're the first to fly? That's over the top. Talk about being memorable. All right. Ina Claire was the single biggest actress in America at that time. She was making $5,000 a week in those days money. 
Fitzgerald's favorite actress. He had pictures of her all over his dorm room at Princeton. He wanted her to play Nicole in the 1934 film adaptation of Tender as the Night. And she was in a play at Lewis's party. And she was managed by David Belasco. Now, David Belasco, his ghost is still said to haunt the Belasco Theater in New York City to this day. If you go to a play or you go to a musical, the stage and lighting design that you see was invented by David Belasco. He set the template for all of that. So he's huge. John Philip Sousa, King of the March Music, some of you may remember who he is, um, not only came with his entire band, but wrote a song specifically for the event. Houdini again. Annette Kellerman comes. Now, who's Annette Kellerman? Well, um, she invented the sport of synchronized swimming. So Zelda was really interested in this because Zelda loved to swim. And Zelda was interested in this too because Annette Kellerman invented the most radical design of a swimsuit to that date in history. And it was the one piece. It was form fitting. It was a one piece. And what Zelda intentionally did was she would purchase one that was tan, brown, beige, that would make her look nude from afar. And she intended that. God loves Zelda Fitzgerald, right? Marceline the Clown's there. How important is he? Simple. The single biggest figure in cinematic history, Charlie Chaplin, when he was asked, Where'd you, how'd you develop your act? He says, I copied Marceline. Marceline was so popular, he had his own comic strip. And in an era today when Celine Dion or Britney Spears might do a one-year residency um, in Vegas, um, he was doing a 10-year residency at the Hippodrome in New York City, which was a full square block, and it was the biggest venue in New York City at the time. I'm going to finish the story with, I think, the two probably biggest things that happened there was he brought a whole circus there from New York City. Um, down on McDougal Street, where of all places in the village is where these animals were kept. And they'd be rented out to plays and musicals in the Metropolitan Opera. So he has half of these animals shipped by barge to 50 miles from New York City, and they're landed on the beaches of Longshore. The other half go on private rail cars to Westport, where they're detrained and march through the town to the delight of Westporters. Um, and the kind of, I think, piece de resistance of the whole party was when at about high noon, guests heard the thunder of distant hooves. And they got closer and louder and closer and louder. Then over the crest of a hill came a stagecoach going at full speed, pulled by six Arabians, of course. They're going at full speed because right behind them are Native Americans chasing the stagecoach. And right behind the Native Americans are cowboys chasing the Indians to rescue the people in a stagecoach. Uh, who's leading them? Well, it's Effie Lewis with a big white 10-gallon hat. But the kicker to this story is that he by private rail car, brought out this mid-19th century Wells Fargo stagecoach from Nevada. The cowboys were real cowboys from his ranch. And the kicker was that the Native Americans were actual Lakota, Sioux, and Apache. But I don't have to tell you, that was probably the first and last time that anybody in Westport had seen a Native American. Now, this is just a partial list because we don't have enough time and I'd kill you if I went into the rest of it. But this is the biggest party in Connecticut history. And, you know, pound for pound, it's got to be one of the great ones in American history. Okay, I'll give you a second to just kind of, you know, glance over these headlines from 1920 in Westport, Connecticut. These are from the Westport Herald. All right, 
So the Fitzgeralds not only come to this town with this mystery millionaire, they come into a town that is one of the wildest partying towns in America at the time. Just to give you an idea, in a mock election, the town by three to two margin voted down prohibition. Fun fact, two states never ratified prohibition in America, Rhode Island and Connecticut. And the interesting reason why is that they had the highest per capita percentage of Italian Americans in the country at the time, both those states. And the role of the wine in the sacrament and the role of growing your own grapes and making your own wine at home, very uh, Italian traditions. So neither state ever ratified prohibition. And by the way, the police force in Westport numbered a grand total of four. Two of them were Italian Americans, so they never made a bust. Um, and the other two were Irish, and I could say this because I'm more than part Irish. You're not going to find Irish who obeyed prohibition by a long shot. So the police were completely disinterested in upholding the law. All the busts that were made in town were done by the state police or by the federal government. I'm just going to point out two of these headlines, the top center, that truck, by the way, it's, uh, again, organized crime and where are they going? They're on their way to Rhode Island. No shock. Um, but just to let you know, that's a, that's a quarter, that's $250,000 uh, in today's money that of uh, worth of booze. And my favorite story is the bottom left, where the taxi overturns in town. Now, what Westporters had noticed was this, ta this, this taxi was never around at night. It only drove through town during the day and it was always stopping for gas. But when it overturned, they realized why. The headlights didn't work. You know, those big headlights from those 1920s cars. It was full of booze. The fenders were full of booze. The side wheels were full of booze. The tires were full of booze. I don't have to tell you that the trunk was. And what they had done was they had soldered half the gas tank so that half of it could be filled with booze. So this is the town. They're in a hard partying town. And again, that's going to be recycled straight into Gatsby. OK, I'm going to talk about that building on the right. That's uh, a speakeasy in Westport at the time. But I want to give you a second to read the article about Fitzgerald in the local paper on the left. Now on the right is the most famous, owned by an Italian American, no shock, but that's the most famous speakeasy between New York and Boston in Westport. It was a mile from the Fitzgerald home. George Raff, Humphrey Bogart were, uh, and Jimmy Cagney were frequent visitors. And as you see, Scott gets in an accident driving from his home to the Miramar Inn. And I guarantee you they had already been drinking before they left the house. But he uses this accident and he puts it straight into Gatsby. You might remember the great party scene in Gatsby where one of his guests gets in an accident. And what does he do? He loses his wheel. So Scott, again, uses his own experience. All my characters are F. Scott Fitzgerald. Now, I'll explain the man on the right in just a second. But there was the other major speakeasy in Westport, the Compo Inn. It had a very steep driveway. We have two eyewitness accounts of Zelda careening down this driveway, straddling the hood of a taxi cab, hanging on to the hood ornament for dear life. In one of those stories, she's naked. You can pick whichever one you want. The brother-in-law of the owner of the Compo Inn, Jake Levy, was the man on the right nicknamed Bald Jack Rose. Bald because he had alopecia. So famous at the time, he was a uh, organized crime figure, that he had a drink that was named after him called the, unsurprisingly, Bald Jack Rose. 
Now, how does he show up in Gatsby? First of all, so he's running the rum roaming operations in Westport and large parts of Fairfield County. He grew up in neighboring Norwalk, Connecticut, the next town over. But you might remember when Nick and Gatsby meet Meyer Wolfshine, and Meyer Wolfshine talks about the murder of Rosie Rosenthal at the Metropole. Well, uh, that was a real life event, and guess what? This man, Paul Jack Rose, turned state's evidence against the murderer uh, at the Metropole in that actual event that's in Gatsby. By the way, it was a corrupt cop by the name of Charles Becker, and he was fried at Sing Sing in 1915. So Wolfsheim talks about this event, but Paul Jack Rose was actually at it, and he was the most important witness in it. So again, very probable template for Meyer Wolfsheim in, in the novel. All right, just read these headlines. They're fun ones. Okay, so <laughs> I told you this is a partying town. Just to let you know about the Fitzgeralds, Edmund Wilson, the great literary critic, friend of Scott's from Princeton, famously said that Scott and Zelda were engaged, quote unquote, in the nude orgies of Westport. So they're in, as Barbara Pope Solomon famously quipped, they were in like a Wild West town that had been settled in the East. And, you know, for those five months, they enjoyed every single second of it. This is just the sale of the house in 1925. Um, Lewis got divorced. His wife continued to live in the house, but then they sold it. Just to show you, this is country life, which the wealthy would have subscribed to. And it's just a description, um, fireproof sables, solarium, gardens with pools, waterfront directly on the sound. And you'll notice that it features three of the things that I showed you as pictures, as you know, examples of how grand of an estate it was. Uh, this is our award-winning documentary, and we're just about to see a clip called Gatsby in Connecticut. Uh, it's 70 minutes long, stars uh, somebody who's become a friend of ours, Sam Waterston. And again, for those of you, I don't mean to repeat that we're here uh, from the beginning, but the New Yorker published last year the top 36 films in America um, in 2020, and we came in at number 30. And it's on all available platforms. And again, uh, you wouldn't be an author without pitching your book. This is Boats Against the Current. Most people get it on Amazon. And um, it's a limited edition. And it's truly in a limited edition of 2,500 copies. I will never be able to print anymore, and let me tell you why. The Fitzgerald estate is enormously protective of Scott and Zelda's work, and it's very expensive to uh, use quotes and pictures and things like that, but they really believed in what I was doing, um, gave uh, a, a great deal to me, but the deal was I could only print 2,500 of these. So, and this is the second edition, it's called the Centennial Edition. I've got new uh, information uh, in it. Um, and it's because last year was the 100th year anniversary. By the way, it is a, uh, a beautiful book. I'm not really tooting my own horn. I've, I've been told that. It's a coffee table book uh, with stunning photos. And people, people really, really love it. Um, and I put a lot of expense into... Um, having it done just the right way. And uh, if any of you want to make a million dollars writing a book, um, it's going to cost you $3 million to write it <laughs> and get it published. But anyway, uh, this is available on Amazon and uh, all platforms. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to transition to our last thing. So just hang with me here as I do this. All right, and I'm gonna come up with a clip from the aforementioned promised documentary. Um, let me tell you in this clip that you're gonna see um, called titled, Who is Gatsby? You're gonna see 
Eleanor Lanahan, who is the granddaughter of Scott and Zelda. You're going to see Sam Waterston. You might remember him from the 74 version of The Great Gatsby. Um, and from Law and Order, you're going to see a leading Fitzgerald uh, biographer by the name of Walter Robichek. You're going to see Charles Scribner III, the grandson of the great Scribner dynasty, again, that published Hemingway, Wolf, and Fitzgerald. So let me show you just a quick clip. I think you'll enjoy it. I really do. Who was Jay Gatsby modeled on? I find it interesting that so many people are digging into who were the sources for Gatsby. There have been some specific names proposed, and then there have been other theories. So we may never know. I heard he was in oil from a man who knew all about him, grew up with him in Texas. I knew somebody who grew up with him in St. Paul. Well, you look at him sometimes when he doesn't know anyone's looking at him. You can see it in his eyes. I bet he did kill a man. Which one is he? Yes, there is something ultimately about Gatsby that we never quite know. You're not supposed to be able to grasp it. Right, yeah. his essence, yeah. yeah. But I don't think there's any any one person who served as a model for Gatsby. He took his experience, of course, as you're saying, it all comes from your own experience. But he blends different times of his life, different people he knew with himself and creates composites. In fact, Hemingway wrote him a famous letter criticizing him for that. You, you should base one character on one person, like I do. Like really? Hemingway does, yeah. You could have the ambition and the pretense that you would be able to see so thoroughly Thorough. into right. another person's character that no part of you right. would show up in the description. And I'm not sure I believe No, that. I don't either. And I think Fitzgerald wrote him back and rejected. It all converges on Gatsby, and Gatsby is inexhaustible. All those people who claim to have a piece of Scott's um, original raw material in their community, they, may, they might have a partial truth. Everyone's colored by their own prejudice and where they grew up. So when we interview people from Long Island, they're all convinced Gatsby's from Long Island. The danger of writing a book about Gatsby is that you then hear from all these people all over the world who've got the key. We're not supposed to read Gatsby and think Westport. That wasn't Fitzgerald's intention. He wanted us to read Gatsby and think Long Island. But since he didn't have those experiences on Long Island, since they came out of his magic year of 1920 on Westport, where he had a beach, he had a cottage next to a mysterious recluse, that's what he's using as his model. I think the interesting thing about all of these speculations and surmises and everything is that it's great if it enlivens the book. It's awful if it weighs it down. Mm -hmm. My father was on the scene when we started to lose our way during Gatsby's time, and he recorded it all. The generosity, the greed, the innocence, and the cynicism, the magnificence and the waste that was America between the two world wars. People read him now for clues and guidelines, as if by understanding him and his beautiful and damn period, they could see more clearly what's wrong. The thing that jumps out for me is she also puts in and his beautiful and damp period, uh -huh. which is... I can you know, see uh, that puts less. it right in your movie. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and again, that's on streaming platforms and um, Amazon, and you can check it out. And what I'll do right now, if you don't mind, is I'll take questions. I, I'll go to the chat function and check those out first. Uh, it looks like we might have one. Um, no, we don't. We, so we don't have any chat questions. And if anybody wants to uh, unmute uh, and ask any oral questions, that would be grand. So I'll give you a second if you want to uh, do that. You well, can also this... share your videos if you'd like. <laughs> so this is... Uh, Giovanna, this is what we, we basically get. Um, everybody is so zoomed out as we were talking about. I think there's a new definition of, of zoom out in the, in, in the dictionary. So uh, I think we're seeing some, some zoom fatigue. And um, so uh, thank you. I just want to point out that Giovanna um, 
has probably put in a full day at the library. And now due to the blessing of technology, she gets to work into the night from her own home. <laughs> and uh, so listen, thank you for all the work you've done, Giovanna, and thank you to the library. And just, I'll leave you on a, I think a positive note. Um, so what's great is that after this pandemic in 1920, after the collapse of the economy, and after a time when black lives didn't matter, and during a time when there were radical new technologies that were being absorbed by a public that was confused by them and disoriented by them, um, just like today with the internet, what happened after all of that? Well, it was called the Roaring Twenties. And I, I'm sure uh, I'm not the first to say this. As a matter of fact, I did read this, this um, headline somewhere else. Um, uh, but I think we're on the verge of the Roaring 2020s. I really, really do. And there was uh, a couple of comments. Annie, you're very welcome. I, I'm glad you, you liked it. Deb, I'm glad you liked it. And it's called Gatsby in Connecticut, Annie. It's called Gatsby in Connecticut. So um, pretty easy to remember, Gatsby in Connecticut. So Giovanna, everybody, uh, thank you. I'm a big fan of your uh, community. I've been there many, many times. Again, you know, I live right um, up the pike. Yeah, I guess it's up the pike. Um, so thank you. I, I wish you all health and safety. We are on the tail end of this nightmare. Um, and uh, let's get ready for the roaring 2020s. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank Bye -bye. you everyone for joining us tonight and to Richard Webb for this wonderful talk and insight into the Great Gatsby, which if those of you who have read it, will it will resonate the, the visuals with what was happening in the book which don't they say uh, art imitates life. So that's there an you go. excellent example of that, right? There you go. Okay, so Giovanna, thank you. Good night, thank everybody. Thank you. Good night, All everyone. Right, good